about 30 minutes, so maybe not. Yeah. I think what I'm going to do is, um, uh, the next thing I want to do is introduce um, our panel. As you know, um, we're really fortunate to have a lot of talented people here today. Uh, people who have conducted research and designed interventions to promote the health of incarcerated pregnant and parenting women. Um, we're also able to share with you the expertise of professionals who work with this vulnerable population every day um, in an extremely complex environment, jail or prison. So next on our agenda is a panel of individuals who will share their frontline experiences working with women who have experience with incarceration and or child protection services. And leading this panel is Mr. Guy Bosch. And I want to give you a little bit of background um, about Guy. Uh, Mr. Bosch is the Associate Warden of Operations at the Minnesota Correctional Facility at Shakopee. This is the only prison for women in Minnesota. Mr. Bosch has worked uh, in the prison system for more than 25 years. Um, in addition to working at Shakopee, he also has been at correctional facilities in Faribault and in St. Cloud. And he's worked as the uh, manager uh, at the Department of Corrections Central Office in St. Paul. So I want to introduce Mr. Bosch to you. He, in turn, will chair this panel and introduce his colleagues to you. So please, let's wa welcome Mr. Bosch. and sit down. So I'm much more nervous when I'm not in prison. So <laughs> if anybody wants to be disorderly or, or uh, disruptive, um, that actually reduces my stress. So I work at the female prison in Shakopee and it appears I'm outnumbered again. <laughs> Uh, Shakopee has 660 women and we're pretty much full all the time. <clears throat> At any given time we have roughly, <clears throat> excuse me, we have roughly eight pregnant women in the facility at any given time. Um, <clears throat> what was interesting about this topic is a few weeks ago we had the legislative advisory uh, committee come down and give it and take a tour of Shakopee. And after we walked through the facility uh, for about an hour and a half, we came back to the conference room and we started talking about this subject matter um, at hand. And we kind of got into a roundtable discussion. And what I found, it, what, what I found interesting was that um, every person on the committee had a different title or a different word to describe the subject. Um, of course, I, I called her an offender um, working in the correctional facility. That's the terminology we, we use. But it was interesting to me to hear that other people on the panel um, refer to her as an inmate. Um, she's also a resident. She's a mom. She's a defendant. She's a client. She's a patient. She can, she's a constituent. So we are all those things together collectively. And Commissioner Ellinger closed his uh, presentation this morning by saying, uh, collectively working on the conditions. Are we collectively working on the conditions? And I guess I really feel we're doing that with this committee. Um, we all come from a great variety of backgrounds, and um, I'm just the prison person in the committee. So, so the panel who was established for the for the discussion today, um, Holly Campo. If you want to raise your hand? Mm -hmm. She is a registered nurse at the jail and a personal care assistant, uh, and at the personal care assistant programs in Carleton County Public Health. And you have the bio, so if you want to read those more in depth. Diane Haugen. Diane is a clinical services division manager at St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health. And Erica Jensen. Erica is the senior counsel for the Project Child. So we are going to start off with some questions, and then we are going to round it off with questions from the, um, from the group or from the audience. If you, if you think about the questions you want to ask, take a minute to think about questions outside, outside of, your, of your work area. Um, it would be nice if you would sit in the role of somebody else, sit in the role of a prison person, or sit in the role of a, of a nurse or somebody when you think about your questions and think outside that box. So um, we'll start with uh, Diane. 
in your bio you talked about continuity of care and about gaps. Can you take a moment to describe what you meant by continuity of care and the gaps that are um, in this system? Um, sure. Continuity of care in terms of um, assuring or attempting to assure that incarcerated women who are pregnant receive care once they leave our facility. Um, from all of my years in working in correctional health, over 10 years, um, there's a desire to do that at the facility level. Um, there's not always the resources to do that for a few reasons. Um, particularly in jail environments, it's a pre-sentence, pre-trial facility. The average length of stay is seven days. However, most women are gone within 72 hours. So that opportunity to make that connection with a woman to find out where she's at with her health, with her pregnancy, is really limited. Um, I think there's a, a, a challenge in terms of access to care out in the community, hoping to see that change with the Affordable Care Act, but many women are uninsured or underinsured and don't have that um, established care. They may be non-residents of our community. I'm with the Ramsey County system, and uh, on any given day, a significant population uh, aren't even Ramsey County residents. So for my staff to even have knowledge of what are the resources in another community are um, certainly a challenge. Um, I think there are opportunities. I think there's opportunities with every correctional health agency to make a connection with local public health. Um, that in and of itself can be a challenge because of the um, different ways in which correctional health care is delivered in counties. It could be delivered through the public health department, as is with Holly and myself, or via a contract that the sheriff has with a community clinic, with an outstate correctional health care provider, with a local hospital. So inherently, those connections with public health aren't there. But I would say folks are, are dedicated and they're committed and we want to do this and we want to do this better. So Erica, one of those committed and dedicated persons, <laughs> can you talk about Project Child? Sure. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Project Child, it's a program that's been around since 1990 in Hennepin County. Um, it was developed as a early intervention to child protection in response to the prenatal mandated reporting law if women use substances during their pregnancy. Um, so women who are less than 34 weeks pregnant will be referred to Project Child rather than Child Protection, um, typically. And we work with them on a voluntary basis um, to try and avoid child, child protection involvement um, and try and uh, help them achieve um, any prenatal needs they would have, including um, abstaining from substances um, and having a healthy baby. So that's sort of our wraparound goal. Um, we have three case managers that provide ongoing services throughout their pregnancy, sometimes a little bit after their delivery, um, which include like referrals to community resources for any, any needs they might have, whether it be basic needs, chemical health assessments, um, mental health therapists, um, housing will help them with as well. Um, so that's kind of, and then we have groups and educational groups and um, other things like that that uh, we encourage women to participate in. Yeah, thank you. Holly, in, <coughs> your, in your bio you stated you uh, work with uh, Carleton County in prenatal and postnatal visiting, personal care system assessments, long-term care, case management and intensive community services, and medication management. Can you take one of those topics and please explain it? Um, yeah. Just to give you some background, um, in, a in a small public health a unit as it is in Carleton County we wear lots of hats and so we have to change our hats on a quarterly basis a yearly basis whatever the needs are within our community and so since I started at public health in uh, the spring of 2007 I've worn many different hats and those are all those things that guy just listed um, my most recent hats though are doing uh, correctional health care uh, in the jail local jail setting as well as uh, doing PCA assessments, um, which is now changing into Min Choices. We got launched last week, so I will be looking forward to that change. Um, however, when I started um, at Carleton County Public Health, I started as, we call them PCH nurses, most of you are MCH, um, and so we're a parent-child health uh, group. 
And so that's what I started doing. I started with prenatal visiting, home visiting, postpartum uh, home visiting. We do universal home visiting in Carleton County. I also have lived in Carleton County. I'm raising my family in Carleton County. And so I had a, a universal home visitor when I had my kids. So it's sort of, it's all come full circle. And so I have an internal struggle working in the correctional facility now coming with a PCH background and wanting all these services and resources for our inmates who um, may possibly be pregnant and also having to serve the purpose of the jail as well as in being safe and secure and um, following the rules behind the jail walls. So for me it's an internal struggle but, but I can see both sides of the story, both sides of, of the view um, very easily because from my background is public health and, and I believe in all of us having equal opportunities and resources. And so to try to provide those in our facilities is really difficult um, from a financial uh, standpoint, from a security standpoint. And so any way that we can start working on um, doing those and providing those services is going to be good. So those were kind of the preset questions, so now we're going to jazz it up a little bit. <laughs> Are we ready? ready? All right. If you could devote all of your energy and all of your resources and all of your passion to one part of this cause, what would, what would you devote it to? And we'll just go right down that line. So Holly. Uh, I would say that probably, just from my background, that education is probably the most important piece of this. Uh, educating the public, educating our inmates, educating our jail staff, um, educating even the nurses I work with at uh, Public Health and Human Services to let them know what types of services we're looking for. That's a unique respons responsibility that we have in, in Carleton County is that we are so closely connected to public health that I can call up one of my coworkers that I used to do home visiting with and say, hey, I have someone over here. It, can you come over and start providing some type of, of visits or just start forming a relationship, if, especially if this female um, is a Carleton County resident, because that way we can get them um, connected with our WIC program, connected with universal home visiting, connected with our Healthy Promise visits. Uh, in some cases, uh, we are starting to offer a nurse family, family partnership, and so offering that or Healthy, healthy yeah, Families very, America. Um, so offering those, those services out there. Another unique thing in Carleton County is um, our Carleton County boundaries, uh, which Carleton County is not a very big county. Our facility, our jail uh, numbers are mid to high 40s before we start getting uncomfortable. We do have to board out to other counties. We use Douglas County in Wisconsin. Uh, we've also used Pine County um, and Aiken County. And so in, the, in our, in Carleton County, we also have um, a state prison in Moose Lake. We also have the Minnesota Sexual Offender Program in Moose Lake. And then we also have the Fond du Lac Indian Reservation in Carleton County. So we're also able to network with the Fond du Lac Reservation to provide some of those services as they have home visiting um, as well. And so if we have someone with a Native American um, background, then we can try to hook them up with home visitors from the reservation and, and just as far as the continuity of care thing as well. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're meeting with people or they can do WIC through the reservation. We also get to use the reservation pharmacy to fill our medications. Um, not all reservations in the state of Minnesota are so generous, I guess. Um, they're saving us many thousands of dollars a year with prescription medication costs mm -hmm. and being able to fill our prescriptions. Mm -hmm. However, they do have a little bit stronger standards, so as far as controlled substances or um, if they break contracts or any of that type of thing, sometimes we have a very difficult time getting medications for them um, free. So we do have those collaborations that, um, to, to help offer better services and to help offer education for our inmates. Well, I think I'd have to echo much of what Holly said. It's that public That's health background. 
Um, you know, it's, um, I think, you know, educating the community, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what jail is, and, you know, there's the whole lock them lock up and throw away the key. Um, and if they cared about their babies, they wouldn't be in jail in the first place. Um, I think connecting, I would love to be able to have my staff connect with every pregnant woman in custody. But again, the reality is some are there as short as four hours. Certainly those that are, are there for a, you know, a day or more do get that, that connection. I think comprehensive policies, um, not just in my facility, which is a large urban jail, that at any point in time we have probably 100 women in custody um, amongst all of our facilities, but comprehensive policies and processes for managing the care of a pregnant woman who's in custody that's, if, if not exactly the same, at least similar across facilities. And that's a challenge because I have a pretty robust staff, 24-hour nursing, seven days a week, 365 days a year at our jail facility, 16 and a half hours a day at our workhouse, 40 hours a week at our juvenile facilities compared to you know some smaller county jails which may have eight hours a week of nursing. So how do you, how do you manage patients, clients, detainees the same way? Um, I'd like to see every pregnant woman have a referral to their local public health agency upon discharge. Again, that's a challenge. Holly and I are at an advantage where we are public health. So we have internally those connections to WIC, to immunizations, to nurse family partnership, family home visiting, immunization programs, community human services, adult mental health. Uh, much more challenging for those correctional health programs that aren't embedded in the public health department. Um, those are probably my goals. Pretty lofty goals, but I don't think they're unattainable. And, and really not that expensive. It may sound expensive, but it's really not that when you look at what the what the, the, the cost benefit is. Yeah. And in the prison system, um, our, the offenders that we get are certainly they're longer than in the jails. We have offenders that, you know, we wouldn't have an offender come in for four hours, and we wouldn't have an offender come in from the streets. So they're they go to the jail, they go through the court process, they come to us. If they get a lot of jail credit, they could be out the next day, but that's pretty rare. So we have a few months, or a few years, or a lot of years to. Um, to, to discuss and to kind of develop a, a plan for this. Um, we have a parenting program, Lori Timlin in the audience is our parenting coordinator at the Shakopee facility. Um, so some of our challenges are maybe not so much at the beginning of it, but what we do after the child is born and visiting and things like that. So it's a challenge for the correctional facility. Well, uh, I'm going to go with a different theme than education, although they stole mine. Um, I was going to say outreach. Um, I think being an uh, early intervention voluntary program, although I, I don't know that all of our clients view us as voluntary, it is. And so when we have women who are incarcerated and pregnant, they still have a choice and an option to work with us. And so I think that reaching out to them um, individually is a really big asset to our program to build a relationship with them independent of um, their provider or the incarceration unit that they're at um, and really identify us as being an independent entity um, and not child protection I think has been um, one of the greatest assets to having women decide to be in our program um, so I really feel like outreach to women um, has been um, really important in letting them know that um, not to be scared. I think there's a lot of stigma that goes with child protection and being reported to us. Um, you know, providers tell them that they're reported to child protection, which is true, um, but it really gets referred to us and to try and ease that fear and anxiety and, and let them know they have an option to work with us and empower that. Um, so I would just say reaching out to, to the women we're working with. Yeah. At Chacopee, as the operations um, person there, um, we have two health service administrators in the audience, uh, um, Peg Gemmel and Colleen Holst. And Colleen and I went to training for a week, and the training was about um, how operations, how the operations person and the health services administrator connect and discuss cases and, and the challenges between the two of us. And um, I think that wasn't always there in the past. Um, so, you know, like when I mentioned at the beginning that everybody has a different lens, they look through this stuff as at, um, at the end, we, we always seem to land on the same decisions, but we just have a different process to go through. Um, can I ask anyone in the panel 
what's working well with the system that we have in place and what's working not so well. Be easy on the not so well. Yeah. Well, that list is bigger. <laughs> well, I call it challenges. Challenges. You know, opportunities and challenges. Um, well, I think one thing that's really working well, um, and I've seen it really grow in my 12 years in correctional health, is the connection that we as correctional health uh, providers have with each other. And it started as some metro correctional supervisors getting together and meeting, melded into a more formal um, group of folks divided by the Minnesota Sheriff's Association in various districts. And the um, Correctional Health Division of the Minnesota Sheriff's Association that gave us opportunities, number one, I think, to meet each other, to find out what are you doing in your county when you have this situation occur? Um, what are the latest trends? Hey, we're seeing this. You know, when I first started, um, pregnant women in jails were pretty infrequent and certainly not opiate or benzo addicted women. And so um, that has really helped a lot of us in terms of um, creating our policies, <laughs> our, our procedures, our practices so that there's some um, similarities. Um, most correctional health programs are administered by a, a different medical director and so there's that practice piece. Um, there is an organization called the National Commission on Correctional Health Care which has standards of care for incarcerated individuals in juvenile detention in jails and in prisons. Um, <coughs> that's what it is though, it's standards. It's not the meat of a policy and procedure and I, I like to refer to correctional health as having a lack of a mothership someone to really guide us and this is how you address the needs of a pregnant woman in jail or an individual with any sort of chronic illness. So um, successes, still some gaps. So Commissioner Ellinger stated that uh, public health is redefining of the unacceptable. In your thoughts, is there anything that's unacceptable right now? You got a brave one. I guess from the perspective of, of why we're all here today, there are gaps, especially in our, like Diane was saying, in Carleton County, we have a 45-bed facility. We have two nurses. Um, one, of, one of my coworkers that works in long-term care fills in for me like today. She's over there working for me today. There's two nurses. We have 37 and a half hours a week. I'm virtually on call every night and every, week, every evening um, to take phone calls as needed from the jail. Um, there's no more calling the ER and asking for, you know, recommendations. Now it's you bring the people up to the ER because that's the option. And so from us, for as a staff perspective, you know, there's a lot of gaps and there's a lot of people that we're missing. As far as uh, uh, people coming into the facility, they're all asked the same amount of questions. We have a medical questionnaire. They're all asked if they're pregnant, if they've delivered in the last six weeks if um, they have a regular medical doctor, if they have health insurance, if they are on drugs, or if they're using alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. We have a mental screening that's standard across the whole entire state. All 87 counties have to ask those same exact questions. But there's gaps in other things. You know, what Diane services can, can offer through a large facility like that compared to what we can offer in Carleton County, it's really, really hard. Um, we, we do the best that we can. We miss a lot of people. Uh, we don't have a chance to pregnancy test. Like Diane said, same for us, you know, seven to 10 days is about the max that we have most people, but the people that we're keeping longer than that are gonna get a little, a little fuller workup. They're gonna, you know, we're gonna delve into a few things. Um, and so we're missing those pregnancies that are coming in because first of all, the person doesn't know she's pregnant. Second of all, you know, she comes in on a Friday and we don't get to do sick call until Tuesday. We're gonna miss the chance to pregnancy test her if she thinks maybe she is pregnant. And so those types of things, I think it's gonna be hard to bridge those gaps and especially in small counties that don't have the resources and don't have the time. Our, you know, it's almost like our hands are tied. There's no money out there telling us here, we're gonna give you money, we're gonna staff you 24 hours a day so that you, there are no gaps, that there, every woman has exact, or every person that comes into the facility has the same exact medical care and medical options. Okay. I would like to add something to that. Um, I might be dreaming here, but from a chemical health perspective, working with pregnant women, um, 
one of the disparities I see is women who are opiate dependent um, in jail. And I know it's, it's not necessarily realistic if they're there for 72 hours, but I would like to see access for medication assisted treatment for women. Um, withdrawal is one of the um, main concerns for opiate addicted women when they're pregnant. Uh, there's a huge risk of spontaneous abortion, miscarriage, preterm labor. Um, and in the jail setting, it's been my experience that um, they're not necessarily having access to methadone unless they've already been prescribed it. But if they're, um, you know, addicted to heroin or pills or things like that illicitly, um, they're detoxed in jail and that can be a real risk to the baby. Um, and so I guess that would be my little, my little, my little chair that I want to sit down about that. Um, I don't know how realistic and how much change that will actually, we'll see in that, but that would be my, my dream is to see that access, especially if they're there for a week or two. Um, it can be a huge way to like connect with clients too through a provider, um, have them see someone outside of the jail so they're not just in there, go to court 72 hours later and I get a report and I don't know where they are. And but at least it would give me some sort of like, oh, they started methadone with this clinic and maybe I can follow up with them. So, yeah. So I gave the panelists a homework assignment. I handed it to them about five minutes before we stepped up here. <laughs> I asked them if you could take all of your education, all of your passion, all of your drive, all of your um, work, ethic, work ethic around this topic, if you could take everything you do at work and put it into one word, what would that one word be? And they looked at me like I was crazy. I already used my one word and it was education. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I'd say optimistic. I really am optimistic that um, we're moving in some really great directions and we're, we're going we're gonna to get there. I mean, the landscape of correctional health care in this topic area for pregnant women has changed, has changed greatly in my career. And um, we'll, we'll get there. Mine was originally outreach, but just I'll throw another one out there. I was going to say hope, um, just because I think that's what a lot of mothers have when they're working with us, hope that they're going to be able to keep their baby, hope that their baby is going to be healthy, um, hope that things are going to work out for them and that they'll have everything they need. So I would, I would say hope for our program. Rebecca and Wendy have five minutes to come up with a word. <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Guy? <laughs> um, I'm just the moderator. I, just, <laughs> um, I said collaboration. You know, I've worked the female facility for four years now, and this topic just kind of hit us fast and swift. And six months ago, we weren't discussing this, and it wasn't on our radar. Um, now we have uh, a lot more uh, information flowing, a lot more communication. Yeah, we, now she won't leave me alone. Now she's got my personal cell phone number. She's texting me and saying, don't forget this question. So, uh, no, so I think collaboration. We didn't have any of this um, on this topic. Um, so a few months ago, what's the best way to get fast information? I Googled it. So I'm sitting at my desk, and, and I Googled it, and I'm thinking there's, you know, I don't know where this is coming from, the, the cuffing of offenders, you know, and, and and is, you know what happened, and, and why is this going to drive operations, and how I'm going to come across this challenge, and in, in, in sometimes a very dangerous environment. And um, you know we have 600 660 women there, but 100 are in for murder, um, and uh, we have a lot of offenders that are in there for killing their children. And um, we have an open campus and lots of programming, and it's a very complex, and it's a very complicated environment. And and to throw to put this in there is just another layer that we have to kind of address. So, um, so I Googled it, and I was assuming that not much was going to come up, and you know it lit up like a Christmas tree. So, um, I think the lights even dimmed a little bit. So nationally, it is trending. Um, it is trending, and and there's a few things in corrections that we always stay ahead of, and and right now what's trending is PREA, Prison Rape Elimination Act. That's nationally trending, and and uh, Minnesota's is uh, on board with that. Um, 
placing offenders on administrative segregation status is trending, um, how often we put them in solitary and for what reasons and for how long and things like that. Um, um, and a third one is, is uh, shackling um, pregnant offenders. We're, per the statute, if you haven't read it yet, we don't handcuff a pregnant offender any time during their pregnancy or three days after uh, they give birth. So um, operationally, I add an extra staff when we go to the hospital with pregnant offenders. Um, so we don't have to do that. So we have two staff there instead of one. Um, we have a do not restraint list where um, there are certain offenders in the facility that we will not restrain um, unless there's an immediate need based on risk of themselves or others, the facility or the the environment, so we will not restrain those offenders in our population, but uh, there's there's challenges with that, but it's not something that is uh, impossible to overcome. There's lots of challenges in prisons. Mm -hmm. We're going to take questions. There's two. Uh, sure. Uh, two okay. Um, I just like what you said about the shackles. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, when you were talking about not putting the pregnant women in shackles. I've been working in Project Child for 25 years, and two times, probably it's been 25, 20 years ago, that um, I was at the hospital with a woman that was in Shakopee, and she was delivering, I was her case manager, in shackles, mm -hmm. and, and with the police, out, the guy outside the door. Mm -hmm. And I just remember, I'll never forget that. I, it bothers me to this day that that it was just a terrible thing. You know, she had them on her legs, and it was just, so I'm happy to hear that things are changing, and I like that part about the no shackles, because it's humiliating, and it's a mother giving birth to her baby, and, and it's an important event, no matter what. So, thank you for that. We're actually looking at, you know, kind of redefining, it, it says in statute, restraint, but, you know, there's other mechanical and chemical restraints that we want to include in that to make sure that that was the obvious yeah and the only time we would ever do that if there is you know kind of a use of force continuum that would require that we do that and, and um, you know I guess uh, harming somebody else or the child or escaping is, is kind of where we land but uh, yeah years ago that was common practice it was common practice just a few years ago so I think some states may do it. I don't know if other, yeah. some states are still shackling pregnant offenders, but. Hi, first of all, I think it's important to sort of know who's in the room, so I want to introduce myself. My name's Carmen McQuitty. I'm a lawyer at the U, but I'm also on the DOC's task force on women offenders, so I appreciate this opportunity to be here. Guy, my question is for you, and I'm glad that the person who does the parenting program at Shakopee is also here, because it's my understanding that we used to have at Shakopee a much more maybe woman and child sort of focused experience where the kids could actually come in, have overnights, and that that's been eliminated. Right. And, um, and I know we're going to have a presentation on sort of the research around that later. So I'd like you to talk us through sort of the reasons um, where you guys are at now and if you're actually revisiting the idea of a more mom-child focused experience there. Okay. Years ago, um, the children, and Lori, correct me if I'm wrong, could stay overnight up to a certain age um, on occasion. And um, one of the two biggest challenges in a female prison are relationships and pills. Prescription medication and cocktailing them and cheeking them and selling them and hoarding them and misusing them is, I can't put it any other way other than it's an epidemic. Um, what happened was we found pills in our Anthony unit, which is where the mothers lived. We had found pills in that, in that, um, in that building. And, of course, the, the warden and her staff, the reaction was, we're not going to have any child in our authority in this prison crawling around the floor where we have narcotics and prescription drugs and contraband being hid. So we shook down the unit, we found the contraband, we closed the program. To this date since I've been there, I think this was before I got there, since I've been there we have had discussions to, to get to that point again, but it takes a lot to kind of forget that because it's a calculated risk. 
and the risk is so great, and I know there's benefit for it. But instead of putting it in the Anthony building, we, we, we talked about putting it in a different location, the facility, maybe in the visiting room, maybe if we expand, maybe getting a more sterile environment where offenders can't hide contraband and stuff like that. Um, our warden is extraordinarily program, has a philosophy on that, and Shock is a very program-rich environment. She gets it, and she knows that's important, and we talk about it. We're not there yet, but it's not off the table, and it's still on the agenda. Lori, do you want to add anything? Um, we do have extended visits between mom and children, so we haven't we haven't eliminated all um, extended visits. So the children do come into the facility, but it's in the administrative building, and it's staff supervised and. Um, the children don't intermingle with general population. So that's sort of the best alternative that we've come up with at this point, so. And I have just a couple of follow-up questions to that. So um, when you say extended visits, what time frame are we talking about? And then also talk to me about the policy around the age at which it's my understanding that at Shakopee up to a certain age, there can be physical contact with mom, but like once the kids hit seven, I think, no more contact. So talk me through that. And then as, as it relates to the pills, have you seen a decrease in your pill issue since you got rid of that program? Well, there's, there's other, I'll take the pill question, Laura, if you want to take the, the, the age question. As far as the pills go, we're trying, we have medication meetings and, and we're operationally and with the clinicians, we're trying to come around the corner on the pill epidemic. It's not just Shakopee, it's nationally. Um, it's, with, with, it's with this demographic of women. We are operationally, we created some medication cabinets that takes the pills out of their, the pills that they can keep on them, away from them. We have more pills that are delivered at the window by a nurse, and we do mouth checks. Um, medications is an ongoing battle. We are not there yet. We, st we find pills every day. So I think the way to go is, is to steer away from the children and Anthony in a general population living unit where all these offenders are because some of these offenders are very you know they can be very violent and very dangerous and I, I don't that's a pretty big risk I think the answer is somewhere else in the facility to allow that um, there is other things that's coming on board by the end of the year we will have video visiting we're not going to get rid of our visiting system but we will have video visiting where they can go to a kiosk and log on and see um, some interaction with a child. It's not going to. It's not going to reduce our visiting hours, but it's just another thing that we can do. We're going to start having a fender email where they can email back and forth and stuff like that. So, there are some some initiatives on on the course. But I think just to put it bluntly, I guess no time in the near future would Anthony come online with overnight visits. I don't think we're close yet. All right. And, and just one of the considerations with overnight visits. Um, was that in order to have an overnight visit, women were in single rooms. And so one additional challenge is that we are so beyond capacity at this point that it's really difficult to isolate that space for such a limited use of that room. But I feel like I get to advertise my program. When you have a visit, and this is DOC-wide, in a general visiting room at a prison in Minnesota, if your child is age nine or older, you're permitted an initial hug and kiss on the cheek and the same when you leave. And that's the extent of the physical contact within the visiting room. So it's very limited. Um, and so it's true for spouses, family members, etc. Smaller children may sit on your lap, but there are also limitations on um, they can't sit on the floor, they can't run around the room, etc. So um, if you have a normal three-year-old, it's amazingly challenging to keep your child in one place and engaged. So one of the um, aspects to our program is that you may have physical contact. And so that's a huge appeal, and it's because it's the human condition. Your children need to have physical contact with you, especially these children who are separated from who is most often their primary caregiver. So one part of our program is that within our visits, you may hug, hold, kiss, touch, do all the things that you would do to have a normal level of intimacy with your child. So it was age and physical contact. 
No, no. So we have, it, it's, it's if you're under the age of 18 and your mom is in the Anthony unit, we have 60 beds. So if you're enjoying a visit, which is four hours in duration, within the facility in our program, you may have physical contact. So our teen group, which is 12 <coughs> and older, I mean these you know, very large adult looking adolescents are sitting on their mom's laps and laying on the floor and doing one another's hair. And mm -hmm. so no, it's definitely not restricted because <laughs> it's what children need to continue to be attached to their parents. So, um, and there are eligibility criteria for our program. So there are people who, based on their offense or their behavior within the facility, would not be deemed to be a suitable risk to be especially around other people's children, much less their own. So not everyone can qualify for that, but. So, the, so, the, so we have a general population visiting room where all offenders visit. And then we have a parenting program where Lori does these extended visits for what she just described. So there's two different delivery systems, and we are also going to have non-contact or uh, video visiting. So um, I think what your questions do is they outline that everybody looks at this, at this, at these issues through different lenses. You know, my first lens is safety and security. That's not Lori's first lens. But at the end, we can kind of come together and compromise and give and take a little bit. I mean, yeah, I had to give a little when I when the law said you can't handcuff women on a transport. I mean, that goes against my security beliefs, but you have to take the other people's point of views and kind of come up to a compromise. So, And I think that's where this is trending, is that years ago these people weren't in the same rooms, and now more and more we're in the same rooms. So I want to have a question for the both of you, um, and I want to think about community health and, and community corrections. And in your experience, it sounds like there's a lot of great home visiting nurses programs already in existence, ongoing. Are there barriers to creating or, or thinking of the jail as the baby's first home and initiating home visiting nurses services to women who are pregnant, incarcerated at different jails, I understand, or, or, at, or, at, or at the prison as there well, prison but certainly nurseries. in the jails, that would start to begin to establish some continuity of care. Um, absolutely. Um, I haven't had an opportunity at St. Paul Ramsey to institute it, but at a previous life in Anoka County, I um, had intentionally worked with the supervisor of the family home visiting um, family health, maternal child health program, and worked with two public health nurses specifically who did um, prenatal, perinatal visits, and um, trained them in corrections, had to put them through safety and security. They had to have background checks and understand that the way in which you interact with a, a, a pregnant individual in a jail is very different than in their home. It, everything from you can't give stapled papers because a staple is is can be used as you know a, a weapon. It can be used, it's contraband, um, and so I had um, appointed a case manager, one of the correctional health nurses, to be a case manager who connected with, whenever possible, every pregnant woman. So there was always one established relationship. Now, granted, that nurse wasn't on 24-7, but it was her responsibility to get the complete history. Because again, we're working with nurses who um, are now responsible for every aspect of a patient's health care and are great generalists, but infrequently experts in one particular area. So that became her area of expertise. She was responsible for offering up that public health referral to the pregnant woman, all voluntary, um, for making that connection then and making that referral over to the public health family home visiting. And that public health nurse would come in and see that woman while she was in custody and would facilitate a referral to their county of residence upon release from the facility or would continue to see them provided they met eligibility criteria and more times than not these women do meet eligibility criteria for, for programming to continue to see them back out in the community. And that was a great, I thought that was just a, a huge success um, that I hope to institute in Ramsey County as well. Did that answer the question? That answered my question. We have a question over here. 
Hi, I was just curious as far as like the parenting education. Uh, how often does that happen? And how many, are, I know you indicated four hours, because I would be kind of curious as to how well the uh, babies are attaching to mine. You mentioned a little bit about attachment. It, yeah, you said parenting education is provided. Or? Oh, okay, so maybe you should respond in part to this. Um, we're fortunate to have a relationship with Isis Rising, which provides doulas, um, if the woman chooses, and they primarily do. Um, and they do two education groups facility-wide. They do one called New Moms, which is for moms who either are pregnant or have a child under the age of one year. It's 10 weeks in length? 12, excuse me. And then Mothering Inside, which is for moms who are incarcerated, any age child, also 12 weeks? Okay, and then within our unit, if you're participating in the extended visits, we have a curriculum that uh, was developed by Purdue University called Parenting Piece by Piece, which is 10 weeks in length. And two of the um, sessions particularly speak to parents who are incarcerated. So that's a component of the parenting unit. So. Um, there are two general population programs and then one specific to our unit. Did that answer? Weekly? Weekly. And then those classes are offered on a quarterly basis. And in the unit, we just run it ongoing and it's open-ended so women can plug in at any point. And I keep it at about 11. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Thank you for just saying that. <laughs> um, yep. Well, I was uh, speaking in terms of in terms of attachment, and if children don't have secure attachment, we know that through research, you know, that this organized attached child or what have you could end up in the prison system as well. In terms of the visits that we offer through our program, they're every Saturday, and we have one weekend a month, which is reserved for the older group. So, conceivably, three Saturdays a month. Within the facility in the general visiting room, visiting hours are Wednesday through Sunday. So you could have some combination of visits, but through, through the program in which I'm affiliated, it's three or, f depending on the ages of your kids, cons you know, maybe every Saturday, but most of the women, I would say, the big obstacle is getting your kids there, um, particularly for women whose children are living out state. Uh, although even women who are in the metro area often don't have the ability, they don't have a reliable method of transportation, the caregivers are overburdened, et cetera. So most commonly I would say women have a monthly visit. And we know that with infants, that isn't enough. So, but, but it's a challenge. Um, it's very hard for the women to be able to get their children to the prison. So 75% of the women at Shakopee will be released in the next two years. So the sentencing guidelines that we get, our average length of stay is around 24 to 36, two to three years for an offender, but 75% will be out in two years. So we have this short-term population which comes in and leaves in a year or two, and then we have this really small population of these really long 20, 30-year sentences. So just to kind of get the, the demographics of how long the women are with uh, are in, under our authority. How many average pregnant women at a time? About eight. I just asked how many how many average pregnant women are in the facility at once? At Shaw could be about eight. Mm -hmm. uh, again, just because we have such a small facility, a lot of times we have no pregnant women. Um, every once in a while we may have one or two who just it, yeah, it's a hard comparison when we're so small and, and they're housing so many more people. Um, I'm looking at Marsha. Marsha's the manager of our workhouse. So two at the workhouse, two, three at the jail. So, I, yeah, I would say five. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, in the in the county, in the county um, that I that that I'm a part of in Hennepin County, and Oak, a handful of counties have um, separate facilities for classifying different offenders. There's uh, in Ramsey County the Adult Detention Center, traditional jail, pre-sentence, pre-trial. Anybody who's arrested in Ramsey County comes there, so they're coming off the street with everything that comes with that. Um, and then um, individuals who are sentenced to, is it a year and a day? A year and a day or less can serve their time, uh, have the option or can be um, ordered by the judge to a year or less. A year and a day. A year or less. Can serve their time at the county rather than off in a state facility. And so in Ramsey County, we have a workhouse, and Marsha Conrad's the manager of that facility that about 500 is our capacity. Uh, same as at our jail, about 500 capacity, so in Ramsey County, uh, and then at our juvenile facilities. We have a juvenile detention center, which is pre-sentence, think jail, kids coming off the street, and then Boys Totem Town, which is a treatment program. So in Ramsey County, we've got 1,000 individuals detained at any, at any given time. And so Workhouse, we have more opportunities to work with women because we know when they present themselves how long their stay is. It may be a weekend, they may be just a weekender. Um, with the exception, we do take some boarders from Dakota County, so they're treated more like a jail inmate in terms of they're there until they go to court and then um, determine what happens to them, all the way up to a year. So we could have many opportunities to work with um, women at the workhouse facility. Hello, I just have a question about reproductive choice. If a woman is incarcerated, uh, does she have a choice if she's within the time frame at which she could choose to terminate her pregnancy? And if you could just talk a little bit about that, please. We don't like talking about that. Um, that's a, it's a, for obvious reasons, a very hot topic, and pretty much any board of commissioners would not want to hear that a woman is terminating a pregnancy while in the custody of their jail. However, my belief is that, um, and I think the facts show that a woman has a right to terminate her pregnancy. Um, I had a policy in a previous life, life that addressed this um, that indicated that the facility wouldn't pay for it, and the, including the transportation, and that you know that had to be the responsibility of the detainee inmate to make those arrangements. But of course, that has to be facilitated. Uh, because of access to phones. So, um, knock on plastic, it hasn't happened um, yet. Um, that I've had a woman in custody in my facilities that has expressly wished to terminate her pregnancy and, and gotten to the point where that is an issue. Have? We have had one. <laughs> Oh, and so in that, in that situation as well, she had to arrange for the appointment, she had to arrange for the transport, so technically it was like a medical furlough, and then she just came back following that procedure, and then we had, you know, we got the discharge orders and were able to follow up with, with that. Um, what I will say is it's, and, it, and this might sound a little bit callous, I guess, but it's the same as if we're, um, if we have an inmate that has a severe dental abscess and needs something filled. The jail doesn't take responsibility for that. In, in some situations, depending on the situation and maybe through the jail administrator, we might have to still do a transport, but the jail's not going to take the cost on for that. So even in our small facility, we have had that situation. Well, I have another question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so women in jail, are, are they not considered a, a vulnerable adult? Because, like, if uh, they're by committed... By law, or what's my philosophy? Well, I think any woman who's right. in custody, it, it's a high-risk pregnancy. But, um, I mean, like, a woman that's committed, say, to um, Anoka, and they want to have an abortion, they can't because they're considered a vulnerable no. adult, and they can't make that decision, they say. No, I just wondered if it was the same. No. So it's different. That's good. Hello, I'm the jail administrator from Nobles County, a very small jail just like Holly's. Um, we have 80 beds, but we house about 42 or so a day. Um, my question is for public health folks. Um, 
In my career, I have had public health nurses do my medical services. I've had a local clinic, and currently we're under contract service. One of the struggles for us has always been, though, to bridge the gap between public health, family services, to get that continuity of care that we were speaking about earlier. And I'm wondering, in the public health, particularly arena, is that becoming something that, jails was not always something they wanted to be involved in. Mm -hmm. And I know that from my other colleagues, and I'm wondering what those changes, what kind of changes we might see in that area. Thank you. Well, I think it's highly individual um, based on the culture of the county. Um, you know, I, I, my history has been in counties where we strongly feel that um, the health of individuals detained in our correctional facilities is a public health issue. You can't separate them. Um, you can um, deliver the care in different ways, and I understand all the various reasons why care is delivered in different ways, but um, I think you need to find a champion in public health to, to, to recognize and to acknowledge that, that public health does need to be involved because 90 plus percent of the individuals who are incarcerated are going to be returning to the community. So just because they're behind bars doesn't mean that it's not a, is or going to be a public health issue. So I would just recommend find a champion in your local public health agency and um, and but in, on a state level, is, are they looking at it differently? Because there is no, I actually been in contact recently mm -hmm. because of my involvement on this committee yeah. with our public health, and it was something they just, they don't have time to do. I mean, their directors are not, that's not a priority. Right, right. Um, and actually, over, over the years, I'm seeing less public health agencies providing health care. Mm -hmm. um, there was a state community health advisory committee report back in 2002, 2003 that did a, a large study statewide about who was providing